Welcome to another episode of Home Theater Tours, and joining myself and DJ is J.R. McCullough. J.R., welcome to the show. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, welcome, J.R. Really excited to talk about your room. Um, it's You've got, uh, as we were talking about earlier, you've, you've learned a lot about uh, sound absorption over the years, and you've done a fantastic job here. Plus, you, you've got a lot of other stuff that, to show off here, so... Uh, you ready to just get right to it, Ari? You ready to get to the video? Yeah, and I, I'm, start you know talking? what? I'm really excited about the sound absorption as well. You've got a great room, first of all, but mm -hmm. a lot of our listeners ask, how can I make my sound better without spending a lot of money? And I think this is one of the ways you can go to really improve your sound. Absolutely, yes. All right, let's get to the video. Yeah, I can give you an overview. So it's a 7.4.2 set, uh, setup. Uh, powered by a Denon receiver. As you can see, there are plenty of sound absorption panels in the ceiling, on the soffits. I've got floor-to-ceiling bass traps in the corner there, and you're going to see the other one in the corner as the video pans around. Uh, two subwoofers there on midpoints of both walls. Those are Sonus Faber wall speakers. I just upgraded to mm -hmm. Sonus Faber speakers in the last, let's say, two months after being in, uh, you know, an aficionado of Bowers & Wilkins for quite a while. But those Sonus Faber speakers have quite an incredible sound reproduction quality for the human voice. They're handmade in Italy, and their mid-range is just remarkable. So um, I went with the Sonetto series for the wall in the center and the Olympica Nova series for the mains, which were much more expensive and much more... Um, it's a higher line than the than the uh, than the Sonetto series. So as I said, I've got the the, the absorption. That's a floor to ceiling bass trap that you're seeing there. Yeah. Every one of the absorption panels is from Gig Acoustics. So Gig Acoustics is a company in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you can do a sound consultation with them, and they will, you know, you can give them the dimensions of your room. You can tell them what your goals are, and they will then provide a curated package of absorption panels that, they, of course, you can purchase from them. And then they will tell you how to hang them, where should, you should put them, and so forth. So this is a solid core door. This used to be French doors. I just re upgraded to solid core doors. And I did uh, pause very briefly on this. My, uh, my heritage goes a little bit further back with theaters. My grandfather owned a theater in Brazil, Indiana. I don't know if the resolution is going to show up there, but the Cooper Theater was what he owned. So... Um, there's a picture there of my grandfather, actually my great grandfather, and then a little bit of a blurb about the Cooper Theater, which is uh, in the text there. Yeah, that's cool. So you can definitely say it's in your blood. Yes, that's an, that's an honored space in the in the McCullough Theater. As it pans around, you'll see some of the equipment. I talked about the Sonus Faber speakers. Um, those speakers are incredible. They're about a hundred pounds each. Nice. Um, they're full range. They go down to about thirty hertz. About 32, actually, with room modes, probably down to 30. And um, I ordered them in January, didn't get them until uh, August. So they take a while to come in. The absorption panels behind the speakers actually have some diffusion material on them to give a little bit of scatter when it comes to the, the, um, the frequency response. The back of this speaker here we're showing, you can see the base reflex port that goes down the spine of the speaker and then the uh, the terminals at the bottom, I I haven't biowired them, but I've used wire world jumpers to replace the little tin strips that you get to uh, connect the two um, ports on the back of the, of each speaker, and that provided a little bit more transparency to the sound when it came to upgrading that cabling. The cabling that is coming from the amplifiers from Music Interface Technologies or MIT. I bought those cables years and years and years ago, and they sound great. You can see in the ceiling, I did do four, four foot, four inch tall absorption panels, and then yeah. the soffit absorption panel between the two SVS Prime Elevation speakers in the back of the room. Those are above the le the seating position. Again, SVS Prime Elevation, fantastic mm -hmm. speakers for Atmos. I've got some wire management in the ceiling to hide the wires. And then as we pan around to the front, you'll see the other two Atmos speakers. Um, well, we'll see the other absorption panel there. <laughs> and then we'll see um, the other wall speaker, my right channel there. 
the other yeah. SVS Prime Elevation, or excuse me, the SVS PS2000 Pro subwoofer is in front of that wall speaker. And then off to the right, you see my old Bowers and Wilkins speakers I'm trying to get rid of. So, Quick question. Uh, Does that glass rattle at all? It doesn't because it's got some good um, dampening rubber. Um, I haven't, I did actually have a, um, a rattle on one of the pictures on the opposite side of the theater. And when I was talking to the guys in AV rant, they suggested using some, some blue tack. So I've got some blue tack behind the, um, the speaker there or not behind the speaker behind the, the picture because the glass was rattling a little bit from the subwoofer right below that speaker. On this side, you've got the other stand-up absorption panel. You've got the floor-to-ceiling bass trap there. And then, uh, again, the, the additional prime elevation speakers in the mm -hmm. front stage. So I've got top, uh, what do you got? top front and top middles, if you're talking about the Atmos mm -hmm. speaker setup. And again, this is the Sonus Faber. These are the Olympica Nova 5 speakers. So this is the top-of-the-line Olympica Nova speaker that they offer. Three base drivers, their proprietary mid-range driver, their DAD um, technology on their Silk Dome tweeter, tweeter um, billet aluminum outboard riggers for stability. And then I've got my, my rig here. So that amplifier that we're looking at here is a Rotel 5x200 that powers the first five channels. So mm -hmm. the two front main speakers, the center channel speakers, and then the two surround speakers on the wall. I've got a Furman power conditioner that I got used. Actually, the amplifier is used as well, as is the Rotel DVD player. I got the Rotel amplifier, the Rotel DVD player, and the five Bowers and Wilkins speakers used about three years ago. Uh, that is the Sonus Faber Sonetto center channel speaker there. And then below that is what I'm using for the preamp, which is the Denon X3700H receiver. Mm -hmm. It has one 8K output that I'm using uh, for my PS5, and it does preamp mode for the main channels that go out to the Rotel amplifier. Off to the left here, we have a um, Blue Sound Node 2i music streamer, a DAC Magic oh. 200M DAC, and an Apple TV, as well as a PS5. So those are my sources, my main sources. And mm -hmm. then finally, I do have a turntable that I use very rarely. It's a monolith monoprice turntable. I think it's got a, well, I can't recall, but it's got a fairly good cartridge on it for the price. But again, I don't use the turntable very much. It's, it's mostly music streaming through Tidal, and the outboard DAC really has cleaned that signal up quite a bit. So there's the monolith turntable there. Very nice looking system. Uh, you don't have a projector, and what we're finding ever since doing the show is a lot of great home theaters don't have projectors. So uh, right. That usually turns a lot of people off to the concept of a home theater because they're like, oh, I don't want to put in a projector. But you can have a incredible room with a large format television. Yeah, that's a 77-inch LG OLED. I think it's a C1. And because I have complete light control down here, when you turn the lights off and the, you know, the dark gray wall on the front wall, the you know all you see is the image. And the black levels are so incredible on that television that the image almost floats in midair. It's pretty incredible. You know, I saw a demo of a Pioneer Plasma at CES maybe about uh, seven or eight years ago where you walk into a completely black room and what they had was uh, the Plasma TV and they had black velvet around it and they just had this gold ring floating in the center of the image and it was just kind of turning. And it literally looked like it was floating in air. And I remember Braden and I walked out of there blown away by it. And that's kind of what you can get with an OLED. Probably the only other way you can get that is uh, the plasma Absolutely. and the OLED had the same level black levels. Yeah, my previous TV was a Samsung 65-inch LED. I, I don't think it had local dimming. And it was it was pretty bad when it came to black levels. I mean, it was gray levels. It wasn't black levels. It was really really disappointing. And when I went to the OLED, it was obviously a bigger screen as well, but the, the black levels are just unparalleled with that OLED. So while you were setting this room up, did you have any um, 
issues that you have to overcome that were would not be typical or something that you could give a pointer to somebody else who's trying to set something up? Well, you know, I when I moved into this place, the first set of speakers that I had were they were Mirage OM9 omni channel speakers. So the the Mirage brand was all about creating a very wide, almost like live music sound stage. And so it was great, you know, it had its own character. But the sound stage itself being omni channel or I guess I don't let me omni channels maybe not the right word, but it it was um, you know bipolar speakers with omnidirectional sound, basically what I'm trying to say there. And um, so the sound stage wasn't precise like you get in traditional two way or three way loudspeakers. And the bass, um, you know, I, I didn't know exactly where to place the subwoofer. I had a Mirage subwoofer as well. So where that floor to ceiling bass trap is is where I had my subwoofer. And then I started digging deep into the you know the audio science of it and listen to a lot of the AV Ramp podcast and work with those guys to understand a little bit more about subwoofer placement. And so I did the uh, very nerdy thing. I did the subwoofer crawl. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you take the subwoofer, you put it at your listening position, you download a bass sweep, you do the bass sweep, and then you crawl around on all fours around your room to figure out where you have the most even frequency response through, through that bass sweep. And I will tell you, there were times I thought someone was messing with my volume dial as I crawled around that room because you would hear the bass sweep and you'd hear the amplitude of that signal dip yeah. so far. There were so many different nulls and peaks in the bass response in certain places of the room that it was astonishing how bad it was. Yeah. So, you know, the least bad position in this room were, as you know, the Harmon people tell you, midpoint on the side wall. So mm -hmm. that's where I ended up placing the subwoofers. And of course, I had one subwoofer at that point, and then you know the guys over in AV Rant really liked the SVS subwoofers. So I found, I think it was a Memorial Day sale, and I got those two PC2000 Pro subs. I think they were return items, so I got them, you know, at a discount. And when I placed them there, the bass response, you know, it just disappears. You don't you don't hear the bass coming from anywhere but the front sound stage. And then the other thing is, you know, I mentioned the fact that we had the omnidirectional speaker the bipolar speakers with the omnidirectional soundstage. And then when I upgraded to the Bowers and Wilkins speakers, I got my first taste of what a real precise soundstage should sound like with the phantom center image that is created by positioning your speakers properly, the sense of height, the sense of width, the sense of instrument placing. But I would say that that soundstage was enhanced and made more precise as I added more absorption to the room. And just yeah. recently, as I mentioned, I had the solid core doors put on. Those were originally French doors to the utility room on the left. Putting the solid core doors there and then putting an absorption panel at the first reflection point on the left and right even further enhanced the sound stage detail by giving me height. So I was really good at receiving you know, the information from the you know what the engineer had intended, I was being able to sit in my main listening chair, precisely identify where the instruments were in the room. The vocals are always straight in the center of the image. Once I added the side absorption, I started getting that height. I, I was mm -hmm. I was envisioning the drums on the riser as opposed yeah. to you know flat on the floor. So for those people who have not experienced audiophile grade speakers in a fully treated room with correct speaker placement, it's a religious experience. I mean, it is just like nothing you've ever heard. And I'll bring people over. I mean, the jaws will drop because they've never heard music that way. Yeah, so you can like reach out to the center of your room and and touch the, um, the vocalist. I yes. try to um, do that with my children because they pretty much just listen with headphones. And so I sit mm -hmm. them in front of my speakers and I say, okay, listen to where the voice is coming from. And you can hear instruments off to the side, but the voice is right in the middle. And that's kind of where it's supposed to come from. Then I'll, I'll move one of the speakers up a little bit or back a little bit to change that. And I say, see how it just disappeared? And mm -hmm. so there is always, there's a sweet spot. And I always put them in the sweet spot. And then I start messing with the speakers to do that. 
And that's something that even if you don't have the highest grade speakers, you can right. do stuff like that to try and at least experience the difference in the sound. And when the sound from both channels hits your ears at the exact same time, that's when you get that type of experience. Yeah, and I'll also mention the speaker placement. So you you had made mm. reference to it. I found a, I think it was a video on the channel New Record Day on YouTube. And the person that was hosting that video about speaker placement really helped me understand the best way to place speakers for my room. And, you know, in summary, what he suggested was you measure your room, you divide it into thirds and then into fourths, and then you put tape along the vertical, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, traversing your room uh, on the length of the room. So effectively what you look like is you've got two parallel pieces of tape and then every 12 inches you make like a train track down the room. And he says, okay, put your speakers right next to your listening position. It's going to sound like crap because you're not getting that disappearance of the stereo imaging and then play your favorite song and then move them and move them and move them into the room close to the front wall until when you close your eyes, you don't hear the speakers, you just hear the music. So that's what I did with the Bowers and Wilkins. To be honest, I'm still experimenting a little bit with the Sonus Fobbers. The center image is not as precise as the Bowers and Wilkins, but that's my fault. That's not the speaker's fault. um, I get a good center image, but it's not like tack- sharp the way the Bowers and Wilkins were. Um, And those things weigh a hundred pounds. So doing the, (laughs) the test with those is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. So I'm trying to just do some adjustments here and there to get that. uh, Yeah. You'd be better just moving yourself uh, instead of the speaker. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. But um, you know, that's interesting. I remember the first time I had heard the term, the the speakers disappear. I had no Mm. concept what that meant until they disappeared. And you go, yeah. now I get it. It's like, I'm looking at the speakers, but I don't see any sound. It, I, it sounds silly to say it that way, but it's like, there's sound coming, but you cannot tell that it's coming from the speakers. And the best way to do that is, in this room, I've got like uh, six pairs of speakers. And so I'll put one pair on, and you can't tell which speaker's on, because it just it's invisible. And that right. is, when you mention that, it's pretty emotional when you can listen to music like that and it just sucks you in yeah i will say that i spend two to three hours a night listening to music but (laughs) as you can hear from my my descriptions i'm most i've got 13 channels of music but i primarily listen to two channels you know i've got title it's wonderful i've got a great outboard DAC. i've got the ability to control every sound and every or every uh, song i would want in the palm of my hand with the blue os app or the title connect functionality and you know i'm discovering all sorts of great music i listen to everything and you know what i find and and this is this is no surprise to any audiophiles out there i find that i like to listen to music that's recorded well more than music that i might like that's recorded poorly have you listened to steely dan hey 19 probably oh, yeah. one of the best recorded and engineered tracks i've ever heard that's one of my yeah. go-to whenever i get new speakers first thing i put on yeah there's a um the other one that i love is dave grusen has a album called um the gershwin connection and i th- think Braden talked about this song on one of your podcasts it's a fascinating rhythm track starts with a drum and it is remarkable then it has a marimba solo in the middle and the sound engineer has done such a good job of localizing the sound that when you close your eyes, you almost visualize the marimba dancing across the instrument as it goes from high to low. Yeah. So that entire album is incredible. That's one of my favorites of all time. And you know that's one of the ones I use for demoing as well. Another good one what is TV thing- Ray Vaughn, Tin Pan Alley. If you get a yep. chance to <clears throat> listen to that too. His voice... Uh, alone uh, on the subwoofer, you can hear it on the subwoofer. It goes so low frequency. You know, sorry, you, DJ, I, I, cut you off. I listen to I listen to two channel most of the time. Right now, it's two channel plus two subs, but it's it's two channel. Right. Um, I do have an Apple TV and I do have an Apple Music subscription. So the spatial audio that they've released in the last year is hit or miss. 
but there have been, I think the recording engineers are trying, are, are figuring it out now. Yeah. You know, like every I, I hesitate to listen to remastered albums in spatial audio because it's sort of like the, you know, in the seventies when they would remix something in the quadrophony or quadraphonic sound <laughs> quadraphonic, and they're like, okay, yeah. let, let me put the drums in this channel. Wouldn't that be cool? It's not cool. It's just, it's yeah. not cool. At all. <laughs> so the most recent albums that I've been listening to, uh, Rina Sayama's, um, hold that girl, um, came out about three weeks ago. And the sound engineer knew what he was doing on that album. The effects are additive, not de- not subtractive when it comes to the That's way that they good, immerse you. Good point, because I have found early on spatial audio was when I first heard it was whoa, and then it then it got fatiguing. It yeah. literally mm. became spatial for the sake of being spatial. Right. And I've been turned off to it, so I just come back into my room and listen to my two-channel audio. I've, mm-hmm. I've got a really nice setup with Kef speakers that have uh, that have the uh, Atmos and all the surrounds, and I just don't. I find it too fatiguing after a little while. But I would mm-hmm. be interested to see what a well-recorded spatial track would sound like, because I also had the same issue with Atmos at first. I was not a big fan, and like everything the engineers needed to learn how to use it and when to uh-huh. use it. And now Atmos is a hundred times better than what it was when it first came out. So I'm yep. hoping the same thing happens with spatial. Now, one thing I'll mention, I've got the blue sound node. I've got the DAC magic. And so that's for, for two channel. And when I had the Bowers and Wilkins speakers, I would say that my experience with those pieces of equipment was great. Obviously great with the Sonus Faber speakers as well. But with the Bowers and Wilkins speakers, when I listen to the Apple TV and Apple Music through the Apple TV, when you think about the signal path, the Apple TV is outputting HDMI to the Denon. And the Denon is the, the DAC inside the Denon is doing the job rather than the outboard DAC. And the Denon's DAC is not very good, comparatively speaking. So when I would listen to spatial audio or just regular audio through the Apple TV, I would notice almost like a brittleness or a paper thinness when it came to the reproduction mm-hmm. of the sound from the Apple TV through the through the Denon. Now when I listen, I still can notice a difference, but the Sonus Faber speakers are so much better than those Bowers and Wilkins speakers that it is less of a jarring experience where you're like, oh man, that just makes you wince. So, you know, I'm now able to enjoy the Apple TV, uh, you know, and the and the spatial audio even more because the, the speakers are so much better. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. So yeah. let me. So you're saying that the better speaker is actually compensating for an inferior deck. Is yeah, that, I don't know it, why, I, but it is. That's yeah. interesting because I would have thought yeah. it would have gone in the other direction and actually made you notice more that it was, you know what I mean? The imperfections, you would have noticed more. It may have been the characteristics of the Bowers and Wilkins speakers versus the characteristics of the Sonus Faber speakers, Mm. because the Bowers and Wilkins speakers are very forward. And, you know, the, the Denon and the Rotel amp are a little brighter on the brighter side. So, you know, you're getting that amplification of the, characteristic that you wouldn't really want to be emphasized but the sonus fiber speakers are more relaxed much more smooth much more well-rounded and so that harshness that maybe gets conveyed through the bowers and wilkins speakers gets muted or 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 reserved when you listen through the sonus fiber speakers so the Sonos Faber is a probably a, a more neutral speaker. Is that yeah, much more neutral. Yeah, much more neutral. So yeah, you're not emphasizing anything really mm-hmm. if it's a neutral speaker. So that's yeah that, but that that's, that was really interesting. Um, to get back to your entire room, everything you're talking about, all of this equipment is all exposed because of the um, the amazing job you did with the sound treatments. Mm-hmm. Getting back to your original statement, it's like. And I wanted to ask you, you, you did allude to it a little bit. How long 
did it take you to add each piece of the room treatments? And so like how much experience did you get with like no room treatments to full room treatments? I originally did, you know, the old clap test, you know, you do the clap test mm-hmm. and you hear the echo and you're like, this is really yeah. bad. So, um, I was looking to do sound treatment and my original foray into sound treatment was very budget. I went to a online retailer who sold basically foam. And mm. so I put foam behind the speakers. I put foam bass traps in the corners and I put um, like a foam cloud in there and it looked horrible. <laughs> and I mean, it looked really, really bad. <laughs> it looked really bad. And, um, but it did, it did the job. I mean, it did the job for what it could do. I and mean, we're talking one inch foam. It was really, really cheap Ooh. stuff. Yeah. So I did that. And then, you know, I, I started listening to more podcasts, you know, the HT guys, the, you know, the AV rant and, you know, dug deeper into what good sound absorption should be. I got turned on to Geek Acoustic, I think through AV rant. I talked to them and then, you know, maybe a year later after experimenting with the foam, I went with the Geek Acoustic, but I started with Everything you see with the exception of the left and right absorption panels. It was fun to put them together. Well, not put them together, put, to install them. I had to get special brackets for the ceiling. They actually sell them. Uh, they give you that air gap and then you know, allow you to suspend them. So that was another, you know, a year's worth of experimenting. And then just recently I did the solid core doors and then the first reflection points on the left and right. And, you know, yes, I'm obscuring my bookcase with that one on the right now, i can move yeah. that if i want to it's understand i can move it out of right. the way and at each step how much of an improvement were you experiencing the first the foam was okay i'm not hearing as much of an echo anymore and i still had the mirage speakers so it was kind of hard to really assess the you know the the impact other than yeah i'm not hearing as much echo when i moved to the bowers and wilkins speakers I was able to, you know, get more precise sound staging with those, and I, and I noticed everything. But it wasn't until I did the gig acoustic treatments that I really, you know, I was saying earlier, almost like tack sharp imaging out of the out of the front two speakers. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, when I added the left and right, the first reflection points, that's when I got the height of the sound hmm. stage to be re- reproduced. The room treatments are almost more important than the speakers themselves. Yeah, it can be. And the other thing I'll say, you know, if you listen to John Darko, he talks about this quite a bit. The advances that have been made in room correction software are remarkable over the last, let's say, two decades. So the Odyssey uh, room correction that's built into the Denon, the Iraq Live that's available through many of the higher-end models, the uh, Room Perfect from Macintosh, all of those systems... Even with my room treated the way it is, if I don't have sound uh, room correction turned on, I can notice a difference. Room correction even even works in a room like this. I would say use room correction, buy sound absorption, and then run room correction again, and you'll get a major improvement in your sound. The quick question, you mentioned you have a daughter, as do I. Is she into music or audio like you? I don't think anybody's as into it as much as I am. Okay. Um, if you were talking the continuum of my family, it's me and my brother are like geeks when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. Um, my daughter and I are concert buddies. We go to all the shows together yeah. and she appreciates this quite a bit. Well, but that's where I, I was going with. I was going to go with this question because my kids are the exact same way and we go to concerts together and they appreciate music and they like music, but they're not uh, into the geek level. So right. I bring them into here, and I, like I said, I sit them in front of these speakers, and they just roll their eyes at me. <laughs> They're like, okay, Dad, it's it sounds good, and uh, it sounds better than anything they've ever heard, but yet they don't care. I'm just curious, are we fighting an ending battle, uh, a, a losing battle, where this audiophile stuff is going to die with us, or is the younger generation going to pick up the torch? I hope so, because, you know, it, it brings me so much joy. There's it does. nothing in life. It does. Music is is such a passion of mine. I was in. I'm in a. I'm on the Blues Brothers tribute band. I play saxophone. You can see my saxophone back there. Yeah, I, and I saw um, 
you know, I play, I listen, and I was in, you know, I was in band in college and in high school. It's just a part of my life since I was in like 10 years old. Yeah. So it's, it's everything to me. It's a beautiful room, JR, and I would be, same as you, coming down there two hours a night. I, I'd be doing the same thing. I do it up here in my, where I'm recording this, I also record my podcast. I do a lot of work, but I'll sit up here and in the middle of the day, I'll just put on some music and just sit and listen for a little bit. It's just a great release. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, discovering new music is the greatest thing in the world, too. Yeah, is, agree. You know, agree. The, the algorithms are very good. Let's just put it that way. They, I, they are su- suggesting new music to me all the time that I... I like, wow, that's great. And then, you know, you dig deep into that. And, you know, my next big passion is to maybe get Rune and start working on, you know, building a Rune server. And and, because apparently the Rune metadata is so much better than anything else out there. And you can really go into deep rabbit holes with the music uh, by using their database of um, of uh, music information. Excellent. Well, JR, thank you so much for joining us. And if you like more of this content, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. If you've got any feedback, you can send me an email, ara at htguys, or you can send DJ an email. And I wrote it down this time, so I don't forget it. It's <laughs> brightsidehometheater at gmail.com. Thank you so much, JR, for joining us. My pleasure, guys. 